what if it had eventually worked? So mm -hmm. what if, in fact, everything had happened the way it did happen? Yeah. In other words, lies were told, right. and investors did contribute hundreds of millions of dollars based on, at the time of those statements, lies, mm -hmm. fraud. But ultimately, the technology worked five years later, 10 years later, and all those investors made money. Technically, the tort of civil fraud requires injury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if it turns out that you were lied to with Scienter, but in the end you wound up making a bunch of money. Yeah. And so if that's what they mean by mm -hmm. fake it till you make it, in other words, the culture of Silicon Valley is to lie and to fraud people. But you know it's going to work. But just somehow yeah. it works and mm -hmm. so it washes away the problem. Yeah. Boy, that's a big risk. Welcome to Emphasis Added, a podcast by the Houston Law Review, where we highlight legal issues with prominent lawyers and discuss the study and practice of law. I'm your host, Kevin Donovan. I'm joined here today by University of Houston Law Center professor Douglas Mall to discuss fraud and closely held corporations, particularly within the context of Theranos, a biotech company that was once valued at $10 billion and is now worth nothing. Our, to introduce our guest here today, uh, many might know him as the Barbie Professor for Secure Transactions, uh, but beyond that, Professor Mall also teaches uh, multiple business law courses at the University of Houston Law Center and has written numerous articles and books on fraud and closely held corporations. So with that, uh, welcome to the show, Professor Mall. Thank you. I'm excited to be here, and I appreciate you inviting me. Yeah, really, really excited to have you, especially right now, because I feel like People in America are obsessed with fraud. I'm talking Anna Delvey, Tinder Swindler, and the topic of our discussion today, uh, Theranos, and in particular, the Hulu Dropout series, or the Hulu series, The Dropout, and also the podcast. And you have listened to the podcast, right? But you have not seen the TV show yet, correct? Yeah, I don't know if I should be embarrassed to say this, but <laughs> I, have, I have watched the Tinder Swindler. Oh, really? On either what, Hulu or Netflix or uh -huh. something. Yeah, yep. Very good. I have started to watch, but it's, in my opinion, painfully bad and sort of hard to watch, the uh, Anna Delvey one. Okay. Um, and I have seen, with respect to Theranos, mm -hmm. I think there's an HBO documentary called The Inventor, perhaps. Yes. Yep. That one I saw. Uh -huh. I have not watched the Hulu series, but I have listened to most of the podcast right. that the Hulu series was based on. Also called The Dropout. And I mean, there's a, I think they overlap really well. So I think. Well, I mean, the whole story is fascinating as we're going to get into. So I, yeah. I agree with you. It's just a very interesting, sad, but interesting story. And it has a whole Houston connection because Elizabeth Holmes, as we're going to talk about, is from Houston. Right. Father, uh, what, like former vice president of Enron or something like that. So oh, is that true? I, I think so. Yeah. That. It has some connection to the company as well, which, you know, maybe, maybe another interesting fraud-esque kind of yeah. situation there. So. For sure. I'm not going to say it runs in the family. I mean, I'm just kidding. You know, <laughs> you know, there's so many people who were involved in Enron. I find it fascinating. Like, not, I mean, I don't think everyone knew about that. Just like perhaps not everyone knew about it at Theranos. Well, if there's a tie to Enron, that is sort of interesting in, yeah. a, in, a, in a sort of a strange way. But. Right. Well, moving on, I, mean, I think Theranos is interesting. Everybody finds fraud interesting. But I'm curious, what got you interested in teaching and writing on fraud in closely held corporations in the first place? Yeah, so when I, um, I spent a couple years in practice, and I was with the commercial litigation team, mm -hmm. and a lot of my cases were breach of fiduciary duty, fraud, okay. um, and then I got very, so, so that fraud sort of just came about because that's what I, a lot of the cases that I was involved in, there was a fraud claim. Right. Um, I really got into closely held businesses because there was a lawsuit involving and this is really beyond where we're going to go today, but something yeah. called the shareholder oppression doctrine. Right. And all you need to understand for me to make this point is the shareholder oppression doctrine is about closely held corporations, and it changes a lot of the typical corporate law rules that would apply normally. They apply differently in closely held corporations. So I found that fascinating. Yeah. And so sort of the combination of cases involving closely held corporations and shareholder oppression and cases involving fraud. Mm -hmm. When I became a law professor at the University of Houston, I wanted to teach not only 
business organizations, but business torts. Right. And fortunately, there were openings. Yeah. And so I basically got interested in it, though, because that's what I was doing in practice. Okay. So it wasn't because you'd been defrauded. (laughs) (laughs) I have been defrauded in a small scale way before, but no, that is not why I, that is not why I chose the topic of, uh, of business torts and business organizations. (laughs) Okay. I, yeah, I think I I had taken your business torts class and I was like, you know, I wonder, I wonder if he like his family owned this like closely held corporation and he got screwed out of a bunch of money and that's what brought him into it. It is funny that you say that because we do have some colleagues, uh, uh, a uh, former University of Houston law professor, um, Julie Hill, used to teach mm-hmm. banking, and her family owned a family bank, so okay. she kind of grew up in it. So sometimes sense. there are those connections. It would be funny if I said I, I got into teaching business torts because multiple torts were committed <laughs> against me. Or, I've just been but, the but victim no, of torts. Yeah, none of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> none of those, I guess, fortunately occurred. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. So before we get into this, also curious, what do you think is the craziest instance of fraud you've ever heard of? Like, is it Theranos? Because I think for me, Theranos is, it's pretty wild. Theranos is pretty crazy. I don't know if I can go a little afield from sort of the business organization area, but... Uh-huh. but oh, yes. Yeah. Floor's I, open on okay, this question. I personally, uh-huh. I can remember saying, before Lance Armstrong came clean, yep. I can remember saying to my wife, boy, if Lance Armstrong... <laughs> ever comes out as, as, you know, he was lying in this, it's going to be unbelievable because that yeah. guy has gone to the mat. He has sued people. He has spent years uh, uh, maintaining that he's clean. Oh, really? He would, he would sue people for doping? Oh, no. Lance that- Armstrong sued multiple people who, for defamation, oh. who said that he was doping. Wow. All of whom, by the yeah. way, were telling the truth. Uh huh. And no, no, he sued them. And there are there lots of, you know, there's documentaries on it. And, and, and you know, Lance Armstrong had, had, perhaps still has, although my guess is less, money. Yeah. And a lot of these folks, he was, I mean, there was a, there's a horrible story about him suing one of his masseuses. Okay. There's a horrible story about him suing, well, I can't remember the other one. But my point is, there was definitely a disparity yeah. in resources. So I, I, I think I would call it a fraud. It was certainly a fraud on, you know, the U.S. Postal Service, and it was a fraud on, uh, I guess, the public in some sense. But right. I didn't care at all about cycling. But I care about the Tour de France only because there used to be a column by this guy, Dale Robertson. He used to uh-huh. write for the Houston Post, and then maybe he worked for the Houston Chronicle also. Okay. But it was all about the Tour de France, yeah. which I don't care about at all. But yeah. I found his columns very interesting. So I kind of got into it, mm-hmm. started paying a little bit of attention. Lance Armstrong, of course, his story is unbelievable. Yeah. And that one still blows my mind. I mean, I still cannot believe right. that, that he was lying that entire time. So... You know, if we sort of call that, that is the fraud that probably made the greatest impression on me. And then I'll just say as a business organizations professor, Enron was was huge. Mm -hmm. I mean, when Enron happened, it's like every media outlet in the universe wanted to talk to a business organizations professor, and there's only like four of us in Houston. Yeah. And so at some point it became overwhelming. A lot of press. Uh, it was a lot of press. Not a lot of podcasts back then, though. Maybe none. I, don't I think know. that's right. I think there's maybe, radio. That's yeah, what people, maybe the I podcast. Think people still listen to that sometimes. Yeah, maybe the <laughs> podcast didn't exist. I think you may be right. But anyway, yeah. Lance Armstrong and I would say Enron are probably my two greatest examples. And then okay. I'm, I'm actually I shouldn't say this, given that it's a podcast, but I'm going to say my own <laughs> example of being defrauded. Uh huh. I say this mostly because I'm embarrassed, but also because I think it's funny. Uh huh. Have you ever, you ever, have you ever heard of the shell game? Like in, in, you know, used to no. be. In, so, so, no. so here's the shell game. Okay. A group of thieves, I guess, <laughs> set up in a public place, mm-hmm. and so I'll just let me just explain how it happened to me. Yeah. And sadly, I was way too old for this to happen. I think I had gotten out of law school. I went to Barcelona. Okay. I'm walking through some main square in Barcelona. Right. And there appears to be this table, where where tourists are betting money, mm-hmm. there is some guy moving shells around. There's a okay. ball. He shows you there's a ball yep, under yep, one yep. of the shells. Mm-hmm. And he moves it around, and it was so easy. He was going so slowly. Uh-huh. And then the tourist would, would, would get it wrong. Yeah. And, I, and, and so then God, all the what dupes... What an idiot. Right. All the, <laughs> all the dupes, like myself, who are there like, what an idiot. I mean, this is ridiculous. Yeah. If I had had $1,000 on me, I would have bet it all. Uh-huh. Of course, I had like $37.22 <laughs> or something. I was a student. 
uh-huh. but you know, they won't. That's they, going down. They said minimum hundred dollars. I didn't have it. They looked around, didn't see any other marks, and they're like, "All right, we'll take your thirty-seven twenty-two. Yeah. So I put my thirty-seven dollars down. They moved the shell around, mm-hmm. and they're going slowly. Like I know the ball is here. Yeah, and I say it's there, but it's not because the old like hole in the table. Yeah, or thing in I the read sleeve. about it yeah, later. Magic. It's in the yep. and then they all while you're bewildered and all the other people who are watching are actually in on it yeah. and so they all crowd in around the table and you're sort of stunned yeah. and you wander away money gone but so let me just say that was my own personal experience with fraud is my own idiotic yeah. experience of getting ripped off in the shell game yeah that's <coughs> that's rich i have not i have not done a shell game i have not it's probably because you're too smart I, I maybe just maybe i just haven't you know gone out you haven't gambled enough right i mean yeah you can, if you Google like mm-hmm. New York shell game, I mean it's humiliating. It's right. something I should have known about, and for some reason I didn't. Yeah. And what can I tell? I've you? had AC an AC repair company try to defraud. Like they came mm-hmm. in and they're like, "Oh, you need a thousand dollars of maintenance to fix this AC unit," and I was just like, "I, I will buy a new AC unit before I pay that much money f- yeah. to fix this old one." But let me get like a second opinion, and then the guy was like, "It's a hundred dollar part." Yeah. And right. then he. Did the hundred dollar part? It worked. Have never gotten maintenance See, to this day. Years. You won't fall for the shell game. When, when you're in Barcelona, you will yeah, avoid it. So. I, I will be safe. I I've heard you. great things though. I, I do want to go to Barcelona. <laughs> <laughs> and and to it's just kind of piggyback off the the Lance Armstrong thing. I think uh, Icarus. I don't know if you've seen that documentary. I thought that was wild. Where the is uh, that about? Who is that about? Lance it's Armstrong? about it's about cycling, and it's uh-huh. a the documentary. Um, Floyd like, Landis. Pro- producer. Let me see. What I think I have it. Brian Fogel. Okay. Just amateur cyclists, and he basically wants to sh- determine like how easy is it to you know dupe the doping system and everything. Oh. And he actually gets the help of Russia's like <clears throat> head of anti-doping to like talk to him about it and everything. This guy named what is it, Grigory Raj Rajkanov. Oh, he's Raj- Rajenkov. That's the guy who either defected or something and he ended up being a whistleblower the beans. yes right. yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's basically and he basically they unravel the whole like Russian doping Olympic thing. And I guess the U.S. actually ended up making a law where it's like a criminal offense now to defraud in an international sporting event. Really? It made huh. like two years ago. Yeah. yeah. I was just thinking about it yeah, you know, after I watched and I just looked it up and yeah. It's uh, so sad. It's also just so mind blowing that that stuff happens on. I mean, I, I, I guess I've now become jaded, but ever since Lance Armstrong, I'm, I no longer see the world innocently <laughs> yeah. any longer. Yeah. I wonder like, why do they do it? You know, like, do you well, think everyone else is cheating? Is that why you do it? I don't know. I think you. I think maybe you. Th- well, I re- having watched now a couple Lance Armstrong documentaries, uh-huh. well, he claims everyone was cheating. Right. Just yep. sort they of like do. steroids in do. baseball. Mm-hmm. It was sort of like it, they justify it as well. I was trying to keep pace. Or like startup biotech companies. Yeah. Hinted at it. <laughs> um, and let's face it, money like mm-hmm. startup biotech companies, like steroids in baseball. If you got good, you got a good contract. And yeah. like Lance Armstrong, if you win, you get notoriety and you get fame and you get money. So right. probably a combination of competition and, and money. And, you know, yeah, I think it's a story as old as time. Right. <laughs> well, to speak about a recent story, let me, uh, we'll, we'll shift us back to or over to Theranos. And kind of first give a quick over, overview of Theranos, because I'm, I'm assuming not everyone that's listening to this podcast has watched the dropout, has listened to the dropout, or you know been up to speed on the story. But basically, Theranos was a biotech company. It was founded in 2003 by its like founder, CEO, I think you know controlling shareholder. I think she owned like 50 percent, Elizabeth Holmes. And the company basically represented their technology was a miniature lab that could do like 200 plus tests with a single drop of blood. And so obviously it was going to revolutionize otherwise, like, I don't know, what is it, phlebotomy, I think is the word. Yeah, but normal, like, blood t- taking where you have to get, you know, into the vein, pull it out, big tubes, and make it super easy so a lot more people could get blood tests. And, and, and sorry to interrupt, and yeah. fast, right? And fast, they, right, yeah. Normally they, you know, you go to LabCorp and they draw blood and they send it out and you get your results from your doctor like five days, six days, a right. week later. Uh-huh. This was supposed to be... I, I don't know what real time means. But like the machine was supposed to be there in yeah. the end, right? That was the vision. And then they just put it in there. And they ended up actually like what testing on patients in Walgreens. They had like a trial at the Walgreens wellness centers, raised like over $700 million. Like I said, valued at 10 billion. And basically later was discovered like this wasn't real. Like that the miniature lab could only ever do maybe 12 tests, maybe. Um, and, and, not, and apparently not even well. Yeah, but, but but you can see just I think it might be helpful for anyone who doesn't know the story, right? You mm-hmm. can you can see why it sounds 
I mean, it is a great idea. Anybody who's had yeah. their blood taken, I mean, even in the doctor's office, right? They bring in the person who, quite frankly, normally works for LabCorp. Right. Or whatever. The, yeah. There's another big testing one, but I can't remember what it's called. Mm -hmm. You know, they, it's a big needle, and they, they take the three or four vials, and then it takes days. The idea that this would be a little small machine yeah. that would run 250 standard blood tests, and you'd get the results, again, I don't know what in real time means, but apparently pretty quickly. Right. Is amazing, and and, yeah. and and the thought of you could use that as we'll talk about, I'm sure, mm -hmm. you know, anywhere could be used. The military could use it. You could use it in 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 you know, you could have it. You could have it sort of any areas where you have. Think about NFL football games, right, where they have doctors waiting, you know, on site in case some injury happens. You could take blood tests right there. So, yeah. So the technology seemed very promising. Well, yeah, I was in the military. You get your blood drawn like often. I don't even know how many, maybe I've got my blood drawn like one or two times outside of the four years that I was in. And in that period, it was like all the time. And I imagine, yeah, deployed. I mean, and as we'll see, like that didn't actually ever happen <laughs> with Theranos, mm -hmm. uh, despite maybe uh, allegations to the contrary. But before we get into kind of maybe analyzing some of these instances of fraud within Theranos, I'd love to just kind of hear, get, get like a nice baseline. What are the legal elements required to prove fraud? Sure. So, so, you know, I, I teach civil fraud. So just to make it clear for yes. your listeners or viewers. Um, so we're going to talk about civil fraud. Right. Criminal fraud is similar, but there mm -hmm. are some important distinctions. But speaking about civil fraud, the, the basic elements of the tort of fraud is you need a false uh, material representation. Yep. This is kind of my, I think, a fairly standard way of describing the elements. So a false material representation it's got to be made with the appropriate mental state. We call that scienter. Mm -hmm. And I think for purposes of this, it's, it's think of scienter as you, you represented that the statement was true knowing it was false mm -hmm. or you didn't know that it was true, okay. which is a subtle distinction but an important one. So the, the requisite mental state is scienter, also known as an intent to deceive, and yeah. think about it as you knew your statement was false or you didn't know that it was true. That's the mental state you need. And an important distinction for Theranos, I think, as well. Maybe. Yeah. And I, I, have a, I have some questions about that. So No, yeah. that's good. Yeah. You know, so we'll talk about that. The third element is there has to be, um, there's, you have to have the intent to induce the plaintiff's reliance. Right. Like it was, it was your goal to induce this particular plaintiff's reliance. Then the plaintiff, I guess I'm holding up four fingers now, then the plaintiff did justifiably rely, mm -hmm. and then there was injury. So again, a false statement made with scienter, intent that the plaintiff rely, the plaintiff did justifiably rely, and injury. And I think in Theranos' case, I mean, there's a ton of instances where it's pretty clear that that's what happened. And so we've kind of talked about like these times where they're like lying to <clears throat> cover up you know, like, oh, we were in the military in operations or like we can do this many tests when there's absolutely no way they could ever do those that many tests um, or that they were what like verified by pharmaceutical companies or doctoring documents. I think all those instances which are in the criminal trial, even though we won't talk about criminal fraud, they all I mean, they line up and it's like, OK, right, of course. But I think there's like there's a lot of instances throughout the company's story where, you know, it, it's unclear, like where did this start to become fraudulent, or was were these particular instances fraud? Um, and I think that actually shows in like the hung jury verdict or the mixed verdict that ended up happening in the, in the criminal trial. But even from a civil standpoint, it's interesting to kind of look at. And I'd like to start first by kind of asking you about defrauding investors because there's you know so many startups I feel like are known for providing these like lofty financials, uh, you know these crazy goals and prospective things. And it seems like you know I. I it seems to me like, are, are they really, are they always defrauding people by, you know, this perspective language and everything? I think when Theranos started out, it like, it seems like that might have been it. And I don't even think any of the early stage investors ever sued Theranos. So I guess I'm, I'm curious, why isn't it fraud when a startup, you know, uses these sort of lofty goals or ambitions? Um, and where, where does a startup maybe cross the line between like salesmanship and fraud? Yeah, I mean, right. That's, that's a good question. And it's the hard question. I mean, I guess the easiest way to answer it would be, right, fraud has to be a, a material falsehood. And it has to be a material falsehood that you made with the intent to deceive, and it has to induce someone's reliance. And so all of us as human beings in sort of ordinary conversation, 
we understand when something is said more uh, speculatively, mm -hmm. right? So, so startup companies saying, we believe that we are gonna be doing five times revenue in two years. It is our opinion, it is, you know, our hope. You know, when, when, in other words, when you make representations that are conditioned with words that do not convey certainty to the listener, mm -hmm. those are the types of statements that you would hope, and the law recognizes, would, would rarely be fraudulent. Right. Because the listener understands that it's only a projection, it's only a, a, an estimate. Presumably, you don't have the intent to deceive, but even if you do, it's hard for the listener to say, I justifiably relied on that statement to my detriment, yeah. when you reasonably should have understand that that was just a projection, a hope, a wish. But when you state things <coughs> that are not stated, I might say, more conditionally, mm -hmm. when you state them more definitively, <coughs> and when they are material to investors. So think about it as an investor trying to put money into a new you know, blood technology. Yeah. When you <coughs> say things that are seem very definitive and perhaps more importantly, capable of being verified, yeah. such as seven of the 10 largest pharmaceutical companies in this country have verified our technology. Right. Which was one of the things, yeah. I may be wrong about the seven of 10, uh -huh. but it was something like most of the have verified it, which was absolutely false. Yeah. Uh, another comment was, um, as you alluded to, our, they called it, the, the machine at one point was called the Edison, I right. think, right? Yeah. Uh, so the blood testing yeah, machine. Yeah, Edison or Mini Lab, I think, or, yeah. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think you're right. And Both. so, and, and Apparently, they would say our Edison, our mini lab, uh -huh. is being used in the military. Right. It is right now being used on the battlefield. Yeah. That is not, there is no conditional language there. Uh -huh. That is definitive. It is material because if you're thinking of investing in technology and it's already being used in way, you know, that's important to you because right. the technology apparently is working. Um, and it's perfectly reasonable to rely on a statement that's represented as a definitive truth as opposed to a conditional statement. So, so let me just come yeah. back to something very quickly uh -huh. and then I'll, I, I'll promise I'll stop talking about this. <laughs> but you sort of said, I'm sort of interpreting your question as where is the line? Uh -huh. And the law often distinguishes between something called puffing mm -hmm. and fraud. Yep. And puffing is sort of a historical term for what we, what is sales talk. Right. And I like to say puffing is BS that we all know is BS. Okay. Like, you know, you go to a store and you ask about the camera they have there and the salesperson's going to uh -huh. sort of, or think about a, a car salesman, right? They're going to talk about the product. Oh, this yeah. is a great product. There's a certain amount of sales talk that we sort of say, like, everybody understands that that wasn't represented to be true. Like, this is the best car in our fleet. Right. And, and what does the, that and, even mean? Right. Yeah. There's two problems with it. Number mm -hmm. one, it's, it's, it's puffing because it's vague. Mm -hmm. And perhaps related, it's puffing because you can't verify it. This is the yeah. best car. What does that even mean? Yeah. Best in terms of it's got the nicest color. Best in terms of it gets the best gas mileage, right? Who knows? Mm -hmm. Which means you can't really verify whether it's true or false, which means you shouldn't have been justifiably relying on that. But saying this is the best car versus saying this car gets 32 miles to the gallon. Now, that's a very definitive statement that you can verify. And I would tell you right now, this is the best car in our fleet. I think would be considered puffing. But this car gets 32 miles to the gallon. If I was buying a car and that was considered material, which seems like it's material to me, yeah. I feel very confident that that was knowingly false. That's a statement I could bring a fraud claim based on. Particularly material right now when it's like four bucks a gallon. Yeah, so. that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. Hopefully that changes. Yeah. But so I, I'm, use, I'm, I'm interested though, I mean, can use of this perspective language or omitting like certain details, can that ever be fraudulent? And I'm thinking about, you know, you talked about the military operations thing and in the podcast, I think they played a, a call to investors. And in this particular instance, um, Elizabeth had like alluded to things being used in military operations, but she never, she was very careful in her wording is what it seemed like. She had never actually said like, we're here now, we're in these operations, but you know, much more just kind of like broad and, and lofty language. And, and so in those instances, can that be fraudulent, even though it's like nothing material is being said, nothing verifiable is necessarily being said, but it's like conveyed knowing that those investors, like they're like, oh yeah, they're in military operations. 
Well, let me say a couple of things. If you're saying that what was said was not material, then it's not going to be fraud, right? Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, a fraud does require a material misstatement. Okay. But but if I go back to, I think, but putting that aside, let's yeah. assume it was material. Uh-huh. And the way you asked the question was, she phrased it in such a way that that it didn't seem as definitive. Yeah. And to mm-hmm. be honest, if your goal is to avoid fraud. Crafty wording. Well, I don't, I don't even know if it's crafty wording, right? I mean, I mean, there is nothing illegal. Mm-hmm. Well, presumably you want to say things that do have a kernel of truth. That's the yeah. easiest way to avoid fraud. But if you've decided you want to lie to someone, <laughs> yeah. and you decide you want to lie to someone about something material, mm-hmm. if you want to avoid a civil fraud claim, and you have scienter, okay. then you need to make it where that statement cannot be justifiably relied upon. Okay. And the way to do that is to condition it in some way. So there's right. nothing wrong with <clears throat> using carefully chosen language, such as, we believe mm-hmm. that the Edison, again, that's the blood machine, uh, will be used heavily by the military. Yeah, it it is, has so much potential to right. be on medevacs. It is our goal to have the military use it. We are in discussions, assuming you are actually in discussions, with the military. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. The problem is it was said, our technology is now being used by the military, which had no conditional language at all, which was represented as definitively true, and which was known to be definitively false. Right. Um, And especially when you're trying to attract people to put money in your new technology, knowing that the technology is in operation is very important and material to investors. So at, at any rate, I, and let me say one other point that your yeah. question reminded me of. You know, you said something like, if you omit information, mm-hmm. is there, can that ever wind up being fraudulent? And, and let me just point out, there's various, maybe the easiest way to say this is, one way you can commit fraud is what we call an affirmative misrepresentation. Sure. I, I say something to you in writing or orally, and it's, it's, a, it's a lie. Yeah. Um, another way you can have fraud in some instances is by silence. Okay. In certain situations where there is a duty to disclose, mm-hmm. if I remain silent, it's fraudulent. Yeah. But, but there's only a few situations where there is a duty to disclose. Sure. But my point here is just silence can, in certain okay. situations, be fraudulent. And finally, there's something that the law refers to as a half-truth. Mm-hmm. And a half-truth is what you reminded me of, because a half-truth is when you say something but not everything. Yeah. You omit some stuff. And the, and the part that you omitted makes what you did say misleading. Like we were in discussions with the military six years ago. <laughs> you know? Right. We yeah. know, we, right. We were in, dis, you know. Well, um, we've discussed this with the military. And it, you know, little did you know, it, it, for 10 minutes, in, it was years ago. Yeah, or, or maybe, yeah. I, I think that works. Maybe, uh-huh. maybe another example is, you know, we are in discussions with the military, although we know that we are within 24 hours of the military rejecting us. Right. And we know that that rejection is coming. And they just we, haven't sent the formal letter. Yet. Right. And we yeah. just say we are in discussions with the military, which is true. Mm-hmm. We are, in fact, they have not yet killed off the, the, the discussions. But right. we know they're going to kill it off because they told us they were. Yeah. Right? So that is what I said is true. We're in mm-hmm. discussions with the military. But what I didn't say, that's going to last another 24 hours, makes what I did say misleading. Yeah. So even omitting certain facts can, depending on the circumstances, be fraudulent. But, but I guess I can't, I can't underscore this enough. It really does depend, in many, in many cases, on exactly what is said and how it is said. Okay. That's not being crafty, necessarily. <laughs> That's actually trying to stay within the bounds of the law. Sure. OK. But I guess another area where the Theranos fell into that I think a lot of companies, you know, at least in the podcast, they had like a, a lot of Silicon Valley and, you know, VCs or venture capitalists like come on and be like, well, you know, there's tons of companies that fake it till they make it. And so I'm kind of curious, like, I mean, within it, the word fake is there, right? Yeah. So it implies like not being misleading. And so where does fake it till you make it for startups fall into this, you know, maybe fraud versus salesmanship analysis or this like omission of truth kind of space? I mean, that's a great question. And to be honest, you know, a lot of the, the shows and podcasts you and I were talking about did say that a, a lot of the defense of Theranos would be the Silicon Valley culture of fake it till you make it. Yeah. And it did make me think, you know, what are they talking about when they say that? So, so let, right. let me just take a couple of cuts at that. Okay. okay. Here's the one thing we know for sure. 
fake it till you make it cannot mean make fraudulent misstatements with scienter that are designed to induce people's reliance, right? Cause, yeah. Because that <laughs> is fraud and that is illegal. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that is also, there's criminal fraud. Yeah. So, so we know it, fake it till you make it, can't mean that because, mm -hmm. because that is not a defense to either the civil tort of fraud or the crime of mail or wire fraud. So, so what's another possibility about what fake it till you make it means? Well, if it simply means you know, you as a founder of a startup company need to remain optimistic mm -hmm. in the face of obstacles and you need to put a brave face on, well then okay, I yeah. mean, that's fine. I mean, that, that could be what, you know, be, be, choose to see the glass half full rather than half empty. Right, I don't think any of us would say, oh, if that's what fake it till you make it means, well then, well, then that's totally fine. I sometimes wonder though, mm -hmm. you know, let's assume, the problem with Theranos, just to spoil the ending for everyone, <laughs> is that the technology never worked. Right, ever. Ever. Insane. Um, which is somewhat amazing. Yeah. But, but I, I wonder, what if it had eventually worked? So mm -hmm. what if, in fact, everything, what if it had eventually worked? So mm -hmm. what if, in fact, everything had happened the way it did happen? Yeah. In other words, lies were told, right. and investors did contribute hundreds of millions of dollars based on, at the time of those statements, lies, mm -hmm. fraud. But ultimately, the technology worked five years later, 10 years later, and all those investors made money. Technically, the tort of civil fraud requires injury. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if it turns out that you were lied to with Scienter, but in the end you wound up making a bunch of money. Yeah. And so if that's what they mean by mm -hmm. fake it till you make it, in other words, the culture of Silicon Valley is to lie and to fraud people. But you know it's going to work. But just somehow yeah. it works and mm -hmm. so it washes away the problem. Yeah. Boy, that's a big risk. Uh huh that that's not what fake it till you make it means. Let's commit crimes right. and commit torts, uh -huh. and it'll eventually all be saved by the fact that the technology yeah. can make money. Um, but I don't know. I mean, there's a, th those are at least three different ways that I, that, I, that I actually, it'd be very interesting to get a bunch of Silicon Valley founders and ask uh -huh. them, what do you all mean when right. we say fake it till you make it? But, I mean, but, I'm taking it as you can lie as long as people make money, right? <laughs> but I mean, I guess it's the, one of the interesting things to me about it is, I don't know, like really, really early stage. So I was in like, the University of Houston offers a, a cool class called like the Cougar Venture Fund. And, and it's all about this, the school has like a real pot of money and they have students come in and you look at startups and you invest money in them. And it, it seemed like everything we read prep, prepping for the class, it's like expect these hockey stick financials, expect these crazy projections. And I mean, I don't, I would imagine that the CEOs, when they put those projections out there, know that like, hey, there's no way that we're gonna be 15 times more profitable in a year. Like it's just, there's nothing, there's nothing leading up to this, but it's still like, it's everybody expects it there. And I wonder, is there a certain point in a company's life cycle where fake it till you make it, incredible optimism is appropriate? And because for Theranos, I mean, they, were, they had like a decade between when they raised over 700 million and that first, those first, you know, investments from people and again, like, I don't think any of those early stage people ever sued them. So maybe they were like, hey, fake it till you make it. Like, it would be unreasonable as a, for us as in Silicon Valley investors to expect them not to be doing that. But then at year 10, obviously, like, we expect that. Everything you're telling us is fully <laughs> transparent and these are real, you know, financial projections. Yeah, I mean, I guess, so I, I, I guess I have a lot of things I want to say to that. So, yeah. so, so let me say first, projections are a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. Projections, simply by the word, I mean, they are by, by their very nature conditional and not certain. Yeah. And so it is very difficult to bring a fraud claim based okay. on a projection. Just because, I mean, by definition, right. when the company is saying this is what we project, they're saying we're not sure. Mm -hmm. And so to justifiably rely on a projection is difficult. Now, believe it or not, there are, it, it is possible to sue one of the, um, without getting too far afield, one, one of, uh, sort of statements you see in judicial opinions that it's just simply wrong, is that you cannot bring a fraud claim based on an opinion. That's actually not true. And, yeah. and the restatement has various <laughs> examples of when you can bring a fraud claim based on an opinion. 
But I guess the point I'm trying to make is if the company has zero basis for those projections, mm -hmm. so when you suggested like they know that there's no way they're going to hit these 15 times earnings, right? that could get them into trouble. They're just like, there's no way we're going to get money unless we have these earnings. So we, that's got to be what it's got to be. Yeah. That could get uh -huh. them into trouble. But I mean, if there's, if by definition, it's a projection. Mm -hmm. And as long as they don't know that there is zero basis for that projection, right. that is a very difficult claim to win. Well, how do you on. prove it? Right? How do you prove, right. oh, you didn't believe, right. you know, the, 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 and like again, some smoking gun email or something. You shouldn't be justifiably relying on a projection mm -hmm. by definition that's conditional. So, okay, so that's yeah. one thing I want to say. Projections are, are difficult. The second thing I want to say is I don't know if we have – I do think all CEOs probably – I mean, I've never been a CEO, but my, my sense is part of their job is to be the cheerleader for the company okay. and is to be optimistic, right? I sure. mean, if you're not optimistic as a CEO – Who's going to be? Right. Why would anybody yeah. um, believe in your company? I, I don't think – you know, whatever fake it till you make it means, I don't get the sense that – it changes based on the life cycle of the company. I mean, okay. if fake it till mm -hmm. you make it means let's commit torts and crimes <laughs> and just hope it all works out, it's illegal whenever you do it. Uh -huh. If fake it till you make it means, well, let's just put on a brave face and be optimistic, it probably, you want that to happen throughout the life cycle Forever. of the company. Yeah. Although it's probably more important at the beginning when, when you're sort of a less established company. Sure. And if fake it till you make it means, um, what was the third option I had for fake it till you make it? Um, oh, well, if it, well, I guess I guess I was just thinking if if it really does mean that we're going to go ahead and commit torts and commit crimes. Yeah. So I, I guess part of my problem is I have a hard time understanding what do they mean by the Silicon Valley culture of fake it till you make it. You right. Know, I I really don't think it means that they're all comfortable lying yeah. <laughs> and committing torts because. That's a huge risk to take. Mm -hmm. If your technology doesn't work, you're going to get sued and or get the government coming after you. Sure. Um, and so I'd like to think it's be optimistic, yeah. make projections, stay with it. Um, but that, but that, that's sort of one of the mysteries in this whole Theranos thing is what does fake it till you make it mean? Yeah. And I'm not sure I know the answer. I, the one thing I just want to make sure yeah. we all understand uh -huh. is by no means is that a legal defense to the tort of fraud. Or, right. And, yeah. and I don't hey, want to. It's, it's all cool. Everybody fakes yeah, it. Yeah. By yeah. no uh -huh. means. It didn't is, work for Theranos. No. Well, and it, and yeah. it, does, it, it, it doesn't work. There mm -hmm. is no defense of fraud, which is, well, everybody else is out here defrauding. Right. I mean, the only way I could even imagine in, the, in my wildest dreams that mm -hmm. working is if you are, and maybe this, okay, maybe this is what it means. Okay. Maybe it is you're an investor who has invested often in Silicon Valley, and you know that all entrepreneurs lie. Yeah. If that were true, mm -hmm. and somehow I doubt that's true, but let's just say that was true, that, that every, all investors yeah. who have some familiarity with Silicon Valley know that entrepreneurs lie. Mm -hmm. Then it might be hard to say that you justifiably relied on, on even their definitive statements if we could actually prove that there is a culture of lying and that you knew about it. Well, I mean, I feel like in a way that is kind of known, because I mean, at least from this class, right? We, you know, reading some investing VC books and everything. And they talk about like investors, good investors do due diligence. And so one of the things in the, in the Theranos trial and case and everything talked a lot about like blaming the victim. These advi you know, these investors invested tons of money. And I mean, Theranos clearly never, you know, showed them, or maybe they did, right? There were some fraud instances. But they still like they they had maybe perhaps not done thorough enough due diligence, and so I guess is there is there anything in the fraud analysis where it's like Theranos' sophisticated investors should have known better, they should have done more thorough due diligence. Is that an adequate defense at all to fraud? Yeah, that's another good question. So so um, so first of all, let me just point out that you're right. You know the term sophisticated investor gets thrown around a lot. And it is true that with Theranos, there were sophisticated investors in terms of very well-off, moneyed people mm -hmm. who have made investments in private companies many times. So, yeah. for example, the Walton family who owned Walmart invested. Yep. Uh, didn't Was the it Viacom? Petsy, DeVos, or oh, the DeVos, DeVos family DeVos, yeah. mm -hmm. invested. I want to say Redstone, the Viacom folks invested. I mean, there, there was a few, yeah. At any rate, mm -hmm. so, so, but one thing I just want to point out is 
sophistication in that sense means they have a lot of resources and they've made investments before. It doesn't mean that they know anything about biotech. Right. right? So another definition of sophisticated investor is someone who invests in biotech companies. Okay. And so let me just first say, sometimes I, I think it's a little dangerous to sort of label this group of sophisticated investors when it really just means people that have money, but they might not know any more about biotech than, than you or I. Yeah. Um, I guess the second thing I would say is with respect to the tort of fraud, mm -hmm. the restatement, and for those who are listening who don't know what the restatement is, the restatement is basically a set of black letter legal principles that are supposed to represent the majority view in this country. And it's very influential on courts. The restatement clearly states that with respect to the tort of fraud, mm -hmm. you as the recipient of the information do not have to investigate the veracity of the information. Sure. In other words, if you just wanted to say, hey, yes, I lied to you, but if you had done an investigation, you would have figured it out. That mm -hmm. is not a defense to fraud. Yes. Um, according to the restatement. Right. And in fact, the restatement even has an example that says, even if the investigation would be easy, you mm -hmm. don't have to do it. And the rationale is basically, you are allowed to trust that someone you're doing business with, with is not lying to you, because other, if the rule were otherwise, it'd be very inefficient, there'd be a lot of transaction costs, because I, I, couldn't, I could not accept anything that you were telling me. I yeah. would have to investigate every single statement you make and think about how much more complicated that would make every single deal. Right. Okay, so, so I, it is not a defense mm -hmm. that you did not take what we told you, um, that, that, that you took what we told you at face value and you did not do your homework. Yeah. Okay, now one other point, let me just say to connect these together. There are some cases, however, that ha say the following logic. Well, you did do your own investigation. Let's take Walgreens as an example. Walgreens mm -hmm. invested a lot of money in Theranos. Yep. Walgreens did do some investigation. They hired an outside consultant yeah. who came in and talked to Elizabeth Holmes and talked to Theranos, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And those cases say, since you did your own investigation, it must be that you did not rely on the statements that Theranos made. Right. You must have relied on your own investigation. Mm -hmm. And therefore, there is no justifiable reliance because justifiable reliance is you relied in fact okay. and your reliance was reasonable. Yeah. But since you did your own investigation, you must have not relied in fact. Now, I think personally those cases are wrong because those cases don't recognize basically part of the human experience, which mm -hmm. is we all rely on multiple things. It's ridiculous yeah. to say that we all just rely on one thing. Right to the exclusion of all others. Walgreens did rely on their own investigation, and they relied on what Elizabeth Holmes told them, and yeah. they relied on other information Theranos gave them. To, the restatement correctly recognizes that partial reliance, justifiable reliance mm -hmm. doesn't mean 100% reliance on what the defendant said to you. It right. means you did rely to a substantial extent on what the defendant told you. So. Yes, you can blame these investors. Could they have figured this out if mm -hmm. they had inquired more? Well, we know some did. Some did inquire and- And then they didn't invest. The company was cagey and didn't give them good answers and they uh -huh. said, we're not investing. Well, and that's what I wonder is because it seemed like the company was cagey in so many different instances. I mean, Walgreens is a, is a great example. I don't think they ever let like their guy, Kevin, great name, um, ever actually like, investigate the labs and they kind of just pushed him off. You know, let's go get, some, like, go get a good sushi dinner or something and talk business. And when you have red flags like that, like clear avoidance, does that not make like you not investigating kind of, I don't know, almost like share the blame or the culpability or anything? No, I think you're exactly right. I think yeah. justifiable reliance becomes a hard element for the plaintiff to establish when there are red flags. Mm -hmm. Because remember, justifiable reliance means basically the, def the plaintiff did rely in fact yeah. on the misrepresentation and that reliance was effectively reasonable. And so when there are red flags, mm -hmm. it is much harder to say that you acted reasonably. Now, let me just point out, because Walgreens, yeah. to me, is the most fascinating example here. Uh -huh. Because Walgreens did, as you alluded to, hire this outside expert who came in, apparently interviewed Elizabeth Holmes and her, and her sort of right-hand person. Sonny. Yeah. And, and, and wrote a report to Walgreens saying the answers are cagey, they're not clear about the technology, I, I think it was something like, I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Yet Walgreens did it. Yeah. Um, 
and so there you might say, well, there's a big red flag when the expert that you hired. But, but let's remember what also happened with Walgreens. Wal it was also represented to Walgreens that seven of the 10 pharmaceutical companies have blessed the sure. technology. Yeah. It was also represented to Walgreens that the technology is being used in the battlefield. And it worked. And, per <laughs> and perhaps <laughs> most mind-blowingly, mm -hmm. the podcasts point out that Theranos brought Walgreens executives, went to Walgreens headquarters, uh -huh. gave them the blood tests with their machine, knowing their machine didn't work. Right, 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 yeah. Set up a whole little demonstration, even though they knew the machine didn't work, mm -hmm. but led the Walgreens executives to believe that the machine did work. They all went to lunch. Yep. This is right out of the podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The executives come back. Theranos presents them with blood information, but it was really done through a third-party lab that they ran out and got done during the lunch break. Right. So, again, you only need partial reliance. Mm -hmm. And so I, I even think Walgreens could say, well, yes, some of the information we got was that we shouldn't have gone in on this deal. But other information that we got said, suggested this was a good deal. Mm -hmm. We are substantially relying on what we've been told by Theranos. Thus, we have a legitimate fraud claim. Yeah, there was a lot. I mean, there's... There is a lot, and you know, in that you kind of mentioned the COO, and I'm kind of curious. Before I, I have another topic, I, I want to talk a little bit about, but I'm kind of curious. So you have this like this romance between the COO Sonny and Elizabeth um, that they concealed, I'm sure, from Walgreens. It seems like they concealed it from everyone. And I mean, is this just another <laughs> example of Theranos' secretive nature of you know Sonny and Elizabeth being elusive and secretive? Or is that is concealing that romantic relationship alone, you know, potentially fraud? So to me, the fact that the CEO and the COO are romantically entangled mm -hmm. could be the basis of a fraud claim. But the problem is, the question is whether it's material. Yeah. Is that material to investors? Because um, there's no question that the CEO and the COO owe a fiduciary duty to the company. Yeah. So think to the shareholders collectively. Right. When you owe a fiduciary duty, remember silence is not fraudulent unless there's a duty to disclose. Yes. But perhaps the best example of when there is a duty to disclose is when you owe a fiduciary duty. Okay. So they owed a fiduciary duty to Theranos. Mm -hmm. So they're not allowed to remain silent about any material fact. Okay. And so the question would be, does the fact that they had a romantic relationship, is it material? You know, is that something that um, the company would want to know about? I don't know, right? I mean, I mean, I, I could make the argument perhaps they did because you want to know that your CEO and your COO are sort of two independent minds who sure. are not perhaps beholden to one another in some way. On the other hand, you know, I could make the case that, you know, who cares? As long, right. as, as, long as they're otherwise acting appropriately, okay. what difference should it make? So somewhere to me, yeah. it could be an issue, but it depends on whether it's material, and we would just have to make the case why that romantic entanglement is or is material. Sure. I, I also wonder about people outside of the company, because it seemed like investors took people outside these these different connectors right i'm talking about like journalists or um, i mean i think in one case there was a lawyer who brought a lot of these investors in or who wrote articles that kind of convinced people oh this is the this is the real deal obviously whatever confidence they had in the company ended up you know not being right it, it was it was a fraudulent company and so i wonder you know say for instance in the um in the example of roger Par roger parloff who wrote the the 2014 fortune cover story the ceo is out for blood um, in the podcast, you know, you hear from Roger a couple of times, seems like a good guy, but that he asked the right questions, but he didn't get the right answers. And I wonder, like, could a journalist reporting fraudulently on information like this be liable for fraud? Or, or if not fraud, like, is there, you know, like, negligent misrepresentation, for instance, a lesser offense? Is, that, is it possible? Because other people did rely on his reporting. And, you know, I talked about a lot about how people actually read that Fortune cover story. It would be, like, in the investment room, and they'd be like, this must be a great company. Here's all the assertions that we were looking for. Good to go. Like, yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, could a journalist 
could a journalist who wrote a flattering article about Theranos get mm -hmm. in trouble for civil fraud? That one, I think I could definitively say, no way. And, okay. and my no way answer would be because, remember, there has to be scienter. So they have to know that what they're putting out is false. Right. Or have no basis for asserting that it's true. Yeah. And I, I, I would see that as basically insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think that anybody knew they were passing on lies um, or hadn't done whatever they, whatever the sort of journalistic homework was to, to, to write the story. Yeah. Negligent misrepresentation is, is, is interesting. Mm -hmm. So some jurisdictions have a tort of negligent misrepresentation that it's not exactly like, oh, it's just the same as fraud, except you don't need scienter, you need negligence. But for our purposes today, it's, it's pretty close to that. Okay. And so I don't know. I mean, just sort of kicking around, is it possible that you could go after a journalist for saying you were careless? You didn't know that what you were saying or writing was mm -hmm. lies. <clears throat> you know, but you should have. You just believed this is the story I want, right? Like everyone wants a story with the ten billion dollar company and the CEO that's worth four and a half billion and is the youngest person to be worth that much. So it's like, yeah. do, you, do you just gloss over? Ah, oh, you know, no need to go into that into the Edison details too far. Like, sounds like it works. I think here's what I would say: the first problem with that cause of action from a plaintiff standpoint would be I would have to establish negligence. Mm -hmm. I would have to establish that the reporter was somehow careless. Okay. The second problem would be, without getting too far afield, that tort has a, a more limited um, scope okay. of who can be a plaintiff. Sure. And so it may very well be that even if there was negligence there, we're not going to let just any old random investor out in the universe who happened to read that article sue. Right. In other words, that tort has a more limited exposure. Okay. Where fraud, we basically say the whole world could sue. Mm -hmm. Negligent misrepresentation, much more narrow. Um, we say only a limited group of persons can sue. and so, so that'd be another problem. Yeah. The third I just sort of throw out there, I am still a person who tends to believe in mainstream media, but as you know, that's a, you know, the dying art. Well, perhaps, yeah, <laughs> certainly. Podcasts are the media that people listen to these days for facts. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at no other point in my lifetime has there been, you know, such, um, you know, sort, sort, sort of so divided about whether people. Yeah, such, such uh, mistrust, right? Yeah, about mm -hmm. about what I would consider. I mean, I didn't, I didn't think anybody questioned the New York Times for the first couple decades of my life. Sure, but, yeah. But, but, you know, but at any rate, so what about the reliance element. Mm -hmm. You know, the you know, it, for me, I yeah. think it's perfectly reasonable to rely on something that Fortune puts out or the New York mm -hmm. Times puts out, but I could probably find many people who would say, but that's ridiculous that you should never rely on any mainstream media source these days because blah blah blah. Yeah. And so so that Especially would be Especially people investing 100 million dollars perhaps. Yeah. So so I would think that let me just say this. Fraud, I think no way. Negligent okay. misrepresentation, I still think no way. Yeah. But there's a, there's a better chance, but I certainly would not be a, want to be the plaintiff's lawyer who's trying to sign up that case. Well, as I meant, you, you were talking about scope, right? Like, if, if anyone could sue somebody that wrote a bad article and then went to do an investment, I mean, like, you, would, you might not have journalism anymore, right? Or they'd be like, it'd be so expensive to run New York Times because you need insurance or, or whatever every single time, or you'd have to edit a piece to, like, you know, the highest level. Yeah, and there's some cases depending on, you know, there have been some cases about people, I used to teach a case in that business torts class yep. that you took. Mm -hmm. I don't think I taught it this case when you were in there, but there was the, uh, um, an author of a book okay. about what mushrooms are safe. Okay. And Ooh. somebody bought the book and went out and ate a bunch of mushrooms that were allegedly safe, uh -huh. and they were poisonous. Yeah. And so the person was, I don't remember what happened. I don't think they died, but, the, you know, they got that's hospitalized. That's tough, yeah. And they sued mm -hmm. the author of the book, and they said, hey, negligent misrepresentation. Sure. And so y you're right that there's all these concerns about, oh, my God, what would this do to the publishing industry? Mm -hmm. um, and there could be First Amendment concerns, depending on what was written about. So, okay. so let me just say, I think that fraud, no way, mm -hmm. and negligent misrepresentation, I I'm pretty close to saying no way, but it's easier because you don't have to prove scienter. But boy, reliance seems tough. The scope of that tort seems tough. Right. The negligence part is still probably hard to prove. Sure. And then I wonder if there are some just policy concerns about we don't want to open up journalists to being sued by anybody for for you know carelessness. Even right. if they even if those plaintiffs would lose. The fact that journalists would have to defend all those suits, we might say, we got to make we got to make it harder to bring those lawsuits. Yeah. Well, 
to kind of shift a little bit away from, well, to shift away from fraud here. So when I, uh, my wife's obsessed with all this fraud stuff, right? She's watched like, I think seven or eight more different things than what we've talked about. And I was like, oh, I'm having a, you know, Professor Mall on. And one, she was like, oh, secure transaction guy from Barbary. Love that guy. But then she was also, <laughs> then she was also, <coughs> Thank you know, God, that was her reaction. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, she liked the automatic stage joke, yeah. <laughs> but, uh. I could have gone, I could have gone a very different way, <laughs> yeah. But she was. Also, you know, I, I was like, well, what do you, I mean, what do you think I should ask him? And she was just like, I mean, how does this stuff happen? And obviously, like, bold-faced lies is, is a big part with Theranos. But then I was also thinking, you know, you write on closely held corporations, and Theranos was a private corporation. It was, you know, close, I mean, Elizabeth Holmes would, would own, like, 50% of it. And so I thought to myself, well, maybe that helped, you know, perpetuate this fraud, maybe as long as it did, right? Because there's a difference between these private companies and public companies, and so I guess I'm wondering, like, what is that difference? And how did Theranos being private allow it to perpetuate its fraud, uh, perhaps a lot more than if it was a public company? Okay, so there's probably two main variables, I think, mm -hmm. that are worth talking about here. So the first thing is a public company, which mm -hmm. Theranos was not, a public company is subject to all sorts of disclosure requirements. And so just think about that, when you're an investor, there are mandatory disclosure requirements. There are annual statements, there are quarterly statements, there's statements that have to be called 8K on, on certain uh, certain incidents, like you change your auditor or something. Yeah. So, so you're, you, you know you're getting information on a regular basis, mm -hmm. and as a consequence, if you're, you know, if you're defrauding somebody, that's gonna be a problem because information is getting disclosed to the investors at all times. You've got to make, there's all kinds of penalties if you, from the SEC standpoint, right. there's private penalties. So information and your ability to access information. In a public company, you have um, um, a high or great or uh, good ability uh -huh. to get information. In a private company, by contrast, you don't have those reporting requirements. Right. And so, at some, if unless you have a state law, sometimes there are state statutes that require private companies to give at least a balance sheet every year, to give an income statement every year. Mm -hmm. But putting that aside, you really are at the mercy of the company in right. terms of how much information you can get. Now, do you have state statutory rights to inspect the books and records of a company? Yes, in every state, if you have a proper purpose. Okay. But that's a but that's a pain in the butt. Mm -hmm. You got to make a request for that to the company. The company could play hardball with you. Sure. Would you ultimately win if you sued to get access to those books and records? Probably. But, but who wants a lawsuit, right? So, yeah. so the first variable is your access to information as an investor, much, much less with a private company. Mm -hmm. And so Theranos being a private company, a lot of these investors just got what the Theranos management wanted to give them. Yeah. The second big variable that I think makes a difference is a public company, by definition, there is a market. Okay. By definition, a public company means mm -hmm. the ownership interests are traded on a public market. And so you always know, if you start getting suspicious that something's going wrong, that you can get out. Yeah. Right? Think about Apple, right? If I'm an investor in Apple and I think some shenanigans are going on, I sell. In a private company, by definition, there is no market. And so that's the other big variable that makes, you know, frauds particularly problematic in the private or closely held company world. There's not a lot of information and there's no exit. Yeah. Once you invest your money, you're stuck unless the documents um, governing the entity provide you with a way out, which they usually don't. Sure. You don't have a market and you're, you're stuck. Well, I think that's particularly interesting in the case of Theranos because you have... I think I think I heard somewhere like all of their board members, you know, members like General Mattis, for instance, like these really really prominent people, were given equity stakes in the company. They were also like a lot of them invested <coughs> personal money in the in the company. And then you have these investors like Alan Eisenman, who like when the company was worth nine billion, tried to sell a stake, and they just said like, hey, we're not uh, we're not letting people sell right yeah. now. And so it's it's just crazy to think about, you know, there's it doesn't seem like there's an incentive to want to find out if the company's not doing well. Because in the end, it's like, you know, it's, it's almost better for them to fake it till they make it at this point because I'm not getting my money out if this whole thing's a sham. And not well, to say that yeah. those people are, you know, I don't, I don't think that they were, were part of the fraud scheme necessarily. But I guess I'm curious, like, 
But was there anything they could do? Was there any legal remedy that they could have sought yeah. out to get out? Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about that, right? Yeah. So, so certainly, as as lawyers or law students, right? I mean, this is what we're we're good at. I mean, mm-hmm. th- this is sort of this is why people hire us. Sure. So it is true that in a public company, you have this additional remedy, and it's a non litigation remedy. I can just sell. Right. I can just sell on the market, get my money, and get the hell out of this company. Mm-hmm. And, and it is true that in a private company like Theranos, that is a very important option that you don't have. Right. Okay. So um, you do have remedies, but many of them are litigation oriented. Sure. So for example, um, you have the cause of action for fraud. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the, the CEO or the COO or the, or the company itself cannot be defrauding the investors. And not only is that the common law of fraud, but we've got securities fraud. So there's there's lawsuits that you can bring for fraud. There's lawsuits that you can bring for breach of fiduciary duty. If yeah. your CEO and COO are um, telling lies to the universe sure. about the company, which ultimately gets discovered and decreases the value of the company, that's a problem for the investors and the company itself. So you've got potential breach of fiduciary duty actions that can be brought. Mm -hmm. Without getting too much into that cause of action called shareholder oppression that I alluded to at the very beginning of all of this, shareholder oppression is all about basically wrongdoing by those in control against minority owners. So you have shareholder oppression, the potential cause of action. You have dissolution actions where you can actually go to court and say, I want the court to dissolve this company yeah. on the grounds of fraud, mm-hmm. illegality, or oppression. So let me just say, you don't have the non-litigation market out like you do if you were an investor in a public company. Mm-hmm. But you do have litigation options, but as we all know, you know, and sort of what you're studying and what, what lawyers listening know, litigation is very expensive. And Theranos had good litigators. And Theranos had a lot of money, mm-hmm. and Theranos hired very good lawyers. Right. And if you were just an investor like this poor guy who put in a million dollars of his family's money in, yep. I mean, I got the sense that probably you almost wiped him out. Sure. Um, right. And, you know, sort of like we alluded to with Lance Armstrong, there's, there's litigation, resources matter. Right. Um, so really, you... It's not that you have no remedy, but it is that your remedies are probably primarily litigation oriented. You can also try to blow the whistle, right? You can try to blow the whistle on the company, okay. which will hopefully and threaten that you'll blow the whistle. Maybe that's put puts pressure on mm-hmm. company management to, well, some, to work. Unless you sell or something, or at least. But other than that, yeah. you're left with litigation. And there are remedies, but litigation, as we know, is, is expensive. But mm-hmm. uh, thank God people still do it because it employs probably everybody listening to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, and also, I mean, it, it sounds like it employed, you know, Elizabeth Holmes's lawyers pretty well. And it's part of my one of two closing questions because I'm wondering, mm-hmm. so I think the criminal trial amounted to like a, a bill in the tens of millions of dollars. I mean, who pays for all this? Like who pays for that? Who's paying for the investor's losses or is anyone? So that's interesting, right? So so it's a crim, so the actual trial is a criminal trial. Yes. And, and it's a criminal trial against Elizabeth Holmes, not Theranos, I believe. I'm not. Yeah, positive. I think so. Right, right. So and at that point, Theranos had already been dissolved. Oh, that's a good point. But is All there right. is there like DNO insurance, for instance? I mean, can you is she judgment proof personally from anything that happened with her company? So let me say this: normally, who the 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 executive that's being sued for fraud or breach of fiduciary duty, mm-hmm. you know, it is it is their burden. They're the defendant to pay for the defense costs. Okay. Now, in a number of companies, there will be indemnification provisions. Okay. Where um, the company will have to indemnify the executive, there's all kinds of requirements here, but just in general, there may be an indemnification provision that says the company has to foot the bill. Yeah. Aside from indemnification, there is also typically what we call DNO, director and officer insurance. Okay. Most DNO insurance policies, to my knowledge though, do not cover intentional torts. So if you were getting mm-hmm. sued for fraud, which is an intentional tort, I don't think the DNO policy would cover it. And if you actually get convicted of a crime, yeah. most indemnification provisions are not going to cover that either. Okay. So who's covering all of this? I suspect it's mostly Elizabeth Holmes, especially if the company's already been dissolved. Sure. 
Um, sort of an interesting side note to this that probably some people know is that Elizabeth Holmes has gotten married in the midst of all this stuff happening. Yes, to, yes. To somebody who was independently very, very wealthy. And so, you know, who knows? I mean, there's been some speculation, having watched all these podcasts, I kind of Googled uh -huh. you know, Theranos and I've read so much junk about Theranos. There's all this speculation about whether Elizabeth Holmes, who was once a billionaire, right. at least on paper, um, because of the value of Theranos, mm -hmm. about whether she has anything yeah, um, but yeah. I think she married Billy Evans, like who's the the heir. Because I was I was looking this up, same as you, and in like heir to the Evans Hotel Group, so potentially worth hundreds of millions, at least worth tens of millions. Yeah. So my suspicion is, and and again, there are others that know more about DNO insurance policies. Is it possible there's some insurance that she has for a criminal trial? I guess maybe. Uh -huh. I don't know what happens if you actually get convicted. But my suspicion is it's probably she is footing the bill. Okay. Possibly there's some insurance available. Mm -hmm. The company's gone under, so I don't think there's any I don't think there's any source for indemnification. Yeah. So I, I'm guessing it's her or somebody who knows more about DNO insurance would have to talk about whether that can cover um, a criminal trial if she's convicted, which. Should I give this part away? At least, uh, <laughs> I mean, she was. Not, She's convicted. Yeah, not convicted on all counts, but no, was yeah. convicted on several counts, mm -hmm. and I guess her sentencing is coming up relatively soon. Well, I have one final closing question. Sure. And so Barbary, several years ago, had posed on its Twitter the question of, who do you look more like? Two celebrities. I, I have a, somebody in mind, but I want to hear what you have to say first. Yeah. Do you think you look more like Stephen Colbert or Bob Saget? Yeah. Yeah. So let me say, um, I cannot tell you how many times, and it's usually law students uh -huh. come up to me and they're like, you know who you look like? And I always say, stop. <laughs> yeah. Don't say it. And then I say, I'm going to guess because yeah. you were about to ask me, Bob Saget, and 50% of the time they go, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the other 50% I say, or Stephen Colbert. And they're like, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. So Barbara beat us this. to the punch though. I don't think I look like either of them. Yeah. At least I hope. Stephen Colbert's ears are kind of funny, but I mean, maybe that's just me. Bob yeah. Saget, of course, is now just kind of sad because he's passed away. Right, okay. It's the glasses. Let's face it. If I didn't have the glasses. Can we, can we do a close? <laughs> I'm too, I'm too, I, it, see, I mean, if I didn't have the glasses, I, and now I feel too awful. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I, mm -hmm. My wife and I have talked about this. Well, I've never seen those guys. I've never seen you know Steve Colbert without glasses, I don't think, yeah. have I? I, I don't know. sometimes think it's the glasses, although mm -hmm. I will say that Barbary once put a little three pictures up. Okay. And we were all kind of posed in the same way. Uh huh. And that was the first time I was like, okay, maybe I, I do look like yeah, maybe, but okay. you know, I think I just look like a nebbishy white guy with glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I think well, we all look the same. I before I ever saw that Barbary post, because I was, I think the first class I had with you, you got Zoom, so I was just like, there's your face, and um, I thought you looked like Stephen Colbert. And maybe it's and maybe you you kind of maybe you talk a little bit like him too. Maybe I don't know. Okay. Just like interesting way of like approaching things and speaking. So there was that's a, my there, you know what I, I, I'm perfectly happy about this because there was a guy. I like Steve Colbert. I don't know. Do you know who Rick Moranis is? You might have to no. be a bit older. Rick Moranis. I think he was on Saturday Night Live. Okay. And he was in some like Honey I Shrunk the Kids like, and with all due respect to Rick Moranis, I don't think he's a particularly good looking guy. <laughs> And before the Stephen Colbert, Bob Saget, people used to tell say me that. <laughs> that I looked like Rick Moranis. So let me just say this. I feel like it's a step up. Aging well. That I have made yeah. it to Bob Saget <laughs> or Stephen Colbert. So I'm not going to fight with it too much. Okay. It is better than Rick Moranis. <laughs> so, so final answer, you're thinking Rick, Rick Moranis? I hope it's not Rick Moranis. Not, not Rick Moranis. But I will leave that. With the jury's out. I will still. leave that to your viewers. <laughs> they can Google Rick Moranis if they need to. And maybe Rick Moranis is a totally good looking guy. I, yeah. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying when someone first said it, normally, here's just a word of advice for everyone listening. Uh -huh. If you meet somebody and you say, you know who you look like, it never goes well. No one likes that. Unless, yeah, yeah. It, it, you better name the most like attractive person on the planet. Brad Pitt, or yeah. Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> right. Like, give me, yeah. I'll take either of those. You yeah, know? let's face it. Yeah, that, that, just not Rick Moranis. Yeah, it's never a good way <laughs> to go. The person will always be offended in some way. Well, thank, thank you so much for being on the show. Professor Mall. I thought this was uh, super interesting. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So thanks for being here. Thanks for listening. Emphasis Added is a podcast by the Houston Law Review. 
If you like what you heard, subscribe to us on YouTube or your favorite podcast app and follow the Houston Law Review on social media or check us out on HoustonLawReview.org. Till next time.